praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Some sermons are characterized as three points in a poem. Let's start with the poem. This is as highbrow as I get. There once was a lady from Niger who smiled as she rode on a tiger. They came back from the ride with the lady inside and the smile on the face of the tiger. If you're a movie buff, you might recognize that from a John Wayne movie, one of the last World War II movies he made in black and white, 1965. It was called In Harm's Way. It happened to be a nurse who was warning one of her friends about a suitor who was a bit of a tiger, or maybe had a tiger in his tank. There once was a woman from Niger. It all reminded me of a story, it's funny the way the memory works, it reminded me of a story I read years ago, perhaps in high school, maybe in college. It was one of those anthologies of American literature, and there happened to be a story in there. I remember reading Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, if you haven't ever read that. It's just a wonderful piece of literature, rather daunting in its message. And then there was this funny story called The Lady or the Tiger. It was by a guy named Frank Stockton. Let me tell you about that story. It's said in medieval times, it concerns a king who had a rather imaginative and creative way of going about bringing justice in his kingdom. You see, he had a large arena. And if any man was to be tried, they were set in the arena against a wall that had two doors. All the subjects of the king would gather around. They much appreciated the king's sense of justice. And the trial was this. I suppose you call it trial by ordeal or trial by fire. The choice was the man on trial to pick this door or that. As the title of the story implies, behind one door was a tiger. And if the hapless defendant were to pick that door and it was open, the tiger would pounce on the man and rip him to pieces. But if he happened by chance to pick the other door and it was open, there was a lady. And given the king's droll sense of humor, they would immediately conduct a marriage service. Gives you pause, doesn't it, Joanne? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was the, the king's creative sense of justice. They would immediately conduct a marriage service. It didn't matter the man's circumstance, whether he was already married or whether he, he was attracted to the woman or not. There they would have a marriage service. And he was married. And I suppose they lived happily ever after, huh? All of this worked real well. I mean, I said, the subjects, they enjoyed these trial days when they would gather in the arena. And it worked great until it was discovered that the princess, the king's daughter, was keeping company with a commoner. This was forbidden. And so the king was forced with a rather unpleasant decision to make. But being true to his practice, he had the man arrested and set a day for his trial. He too would be put in the arena to pick this door or that. The day came. The man stood in the arena, debating in his mind which door to pick. 
He looked up into the crowd. He saw the king. And next to the king, the king's daughter. And as he looked with longing eyes to the princess, very subtly, very covertly, suddenly he saw her hand. And that, my friends, is the end of the story. Oh, it's not that Frank Stockton doesn't have a postscript. He says, what do which door did she indicate? Which door did he pick? Did he pick the tiger? Did he pick the lady? And you can think of all the permutations of that story. I'll leave that to you. A decision, an unpleasant decision faced first by a king, then by the princess, then by the object of her love. I hate cliffhangers, don't you? When I was a kid, we used to go to the Grand Theater on Main, Main Street in Jamestown, North Dakota. It cost us a whole dime to go see, you know, Batman and Robin, Hopalong Cassidy, some horse opera, and they always ended with that cliffhanger, so you had to come back next week with your shiny dime and see what happened. What happened next? Fortunately, Scripture provides us a resolution. One fine day, Saul went to Caiaphas and he said, You know, these Christians are a pain in the butt, these followers, these disciples of Jesus. Give me a letter, I'm going to go down to Damascus, and if I find any that are following in the way of Christ, I'll take care of them. All was right and good and true in Saul's life, <laughs> until he got to a certain point along that road. And suddenly he was blinded by the light. He was knocked from his horse. Those with him, they didn't hear, they, 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 they didn't see a thing. They heard something. It was perhaps like in the sixth chapter of John. Perhaps they heard thunder. Perhaps they heard the voice of God. This is what Karl Barth, the theologian, calls the moment of crisis that comes for all of us. An unpleasant decision, this way or that. The tiger or the lady. God's way or my own way. We don't like to be forced into a place to be likened to Saul, who became all. We know all this. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. We know. I can't, still can't remember who the great Englishman who said, you know, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Did I mention the subjects of the king? They enjoyed sitting in the arena as long as it was somebody else and not them. Oh, we know. We know that we are confronted with conscientious decisions and choices that we must make. And, and when we think of the two doors, we think of the revelation of John where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You don't even have to choose the door. He stands and knocks. He tells you he's the princess who tells you? Choose life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Folks, don't think it's just 
knee-jerk and ordinary. We have come to a day in this country, in the history of this world, when people, again, Christians, are having to make that choice. Who will you serve? And have you experienced, this question is not for me, this question is for you. This question is not even for the Apostle Paul. We know the outcome of that story, how Ananias restored his sight, and how many centuries later, Hank Williams Sr., I saw the light, I saw the light. The other day after we received one of these letters, I had a long day. We spent a couple hours in the lawyer's office. That's not my favorite thing to do. I went home. I couldn't sleep. That happens rarely. And I finally gave it up to God. I just started praying, and a light came. You know I'm not one of these people given to visions of angels, but a light came. Paul saw the light. We know that he became the greatest of the, all the apostles, that he had a real eye-opener on that road to Damascus, one that robbed him of his sight and then gave it back so that he might take three missionary journeys all over the ancient world to make disciples for Jesus Christ. You and I, every day, this is what Luther said, not just every week, but every day. Hmm? We face a decision, a moment of crisis. Am I going to serve God or am I going to serve myself? And don't be so glib as to be one in the crowd who says, I'm glad it's him, not me. Because you too face that decision. Jesus stands at your door and he knocks. And Robert Frost was right. Two roads in a yellow wood diverged. And I took the one less traveled by. And that's made all the difference. You can look back in your life and you can see the decisions you made. Some people can even remember when they finally decided to yield up their will to God. To give their lives to Jesus Christ. The real eye opener, isn't it? It's a real eye opener. The other day I read about a starlet out in Hollywood who is now suing a, a website for publishing her real date of birth. You know, in Hollywood, if you're 41, you're over the hill. <laughs> Pastor Ergens. Don't worry, we're still here. You don't have to start looking for jobs. If you're 41 in Hollywood, you're over the hill, so she's been telling everybody she's 34, and then some website told everybody she was actually 41. Now she's suing this website for telling the truth. Is that the kind of world we live in? Where you now sue people because they tell the truth? Oh gosh, I guess that is the kind of world we live in, isn't it, Anne? Where a congregation gets sued for telling the truth? I'm sorry, shame on you people that are out there reassuring yourself that you're doing a good thing. All that's necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to stand around and watch Jesus be whipped and hung on a cross. And that's you, and that's me, and that's them. And it is a moment of crisis for each of us. Martin Niemöller, a confessing pastor in the Nazi era, he said this, he said, when they came for the Jews, I didn't stand up because I wasn't a Jew. And when they came for the developmentally challenged, I didn't stand up for them because I'm not developmentally challenged. And when they came for this group, and when they came for that, and when they came for the Catholics, and they came after the, the union leaders, I, I didn't stand up. I'm not one of them. 
And when they came for me, there was nobody left to stand up. You understand? You have a choice, this door or that. God's way or the way of the world. You see? This is the road less. You're on the road less traveled. Do you know that? We'll take the high road. They can take the low road. And we'll get to God's kingdom before anybody else because standing for the word, that's what it's all about, you see. And we will face, and we have faced, that decision. And we have proclaimed that we are not those of whom they say that there are none so blind that they will not see. We will, take, we will pledge our troth with the Apostle Paul, who had to be knocked off his horse and blinded by the light to see the way of God. Perhaps we too will see his way and others. There is repentance. There is forgiveness. And I'm glad it's not in my hands. So there was this lady you've heard me tell before about the lady who lived next door to an atheist, and one morning, she, every morning, she'd come out on her porch and she'd say, oh, praise the Lord for a wonderful new day. And every morning her neighbor would say to her, there is no God. One day she plaintively stood on her porch and said, Lord, I don't have any groceries. Give me some groceries. The next morning there was a bag of groceries on her porch, and she said, oh, praise the Lord for giving me those groceries. And her neighbor popped out, the atheist, and he said, uh, there is no God. I bought those groceries for you. And the lady looked to heaven, and she said, praise the Lord. He gave me the groceries and made the devil pay for them. <laughs> you and I, we stand between those two people, between the atheism the practical atheism of the world in which we live and the fervent belief of another, it's up to you, eh? It's up to you and it's up to me to make the right decision, to make that choice, the tiger or the lady, God's way or your own way the law, or the gospel. And as for this sermon, it'll be continued next week. Amen. <laughs> the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let <laughs>
Christ truly has triumphed, and now let us give him the glory as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died in the Spirit. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.